So now, very important to realize that if you are genuinely going for zero, uh, as opposed to sort of 10, 20%, you know, which is certainly worth going for, but if you're trying to go to zero, you can't do it on your own. No small entity can do it on your own. Ultimately, there's got to be a world agreement about this, and, and it really isn't going to happen without that. So Bristol can't decarbonize itself without Britain decarbonizing, and Britain can't decarbonize without the world doing it. So we've got to realize that there is a context out there. So what you get on, you know, I've, I've imagined this great chasm here between the uh, political and, and physical realism, and uh, pr pretty well everybody's operating on the left-hand bank, furiously building all sorts of stuff, you know, out into, the, out into space trying to get there. Very worthy stuff going on. But you tend to run out of political or economic cover after about 20, 20 or 30 percent. And then you think, well, now what do we do? And then you go back and you start building another one. Um, now, what we've done is we said, OK, ultimately, physical reality must trump economic and political reality. Is there anybody who would like to disagree with that? No, OK. So we're not stupid, or at least if we are, then you are too. But, so what we've done is that we've, we've done it. It is a thought experiment. We've gone to the other side of the chasm and said, are they actually possible? These zero carbon worlds, are they actually possible? Um, we need to have a few of those because lots of people say, no, you can't do it. It's impossible. Even, in, even with the best will in the world, you can't get there. So we've tried to construct uh, actual functioning zero carbon worlds on the other side. So there's our, there's our little uh, uh, <coughs> foundation that we've actually created there. And then we're imagining there's a kind of backcasting process that can go on. You can actually say, could we actually start to join the dots? We know where we're moving on from here. Uh, what, how, how might we start to get there? Um, and there's a, there's a sort of plan view version of this, you can imagine. Uh, let's imagine looking down on your chasm there. Let's imagine you're there at A. Uh, actually looking across and saying, oh, look, that's where we need to go, might not actually be the optimum strategy. You need to think about these things. Uh, it could be that uh, uh, B is the best place to cross over. And, and oddly enough, you might find you actually have to retreat from where you think you're going and sort of go around a bit and then find a good place and then start to work on uh, where you're going. So it isn't necessarily the obvious direction uh, that, that you would need to go. So what we're trying to do is, in a sense, uh, create a dialogue about possible uh, future zero carbon uh, situations. So we've got, uh, we, we, we do seem to be short of time, so we've got to get going. Uh, we do need a series of, of plan Bs, as it were, uh, that, that, you know, for rapid decarbonisation. And you need to look at lots of destinations and start backcasting. And then there needs to be quite a big political dialogue um, <coughs> and, and international coordination. And, and of course, we're going to need a lot of research programs so that when we actually need the decisions we have the data so we need the research to happen beforehand now what is obvious here is that it's completely utopian people say this is ridiculous if you're short of time you're asking for all sorts of things which are not actually practical but um <laughs> so I, I we have to say that's all we can do we just have to get on with it it might seem utopian but this we are full of hope that this is possible and this is going to happen even though a betting person might sort of say i'm not going to put any money on it uh, okay so now how fast do we have to go now this is this is quite interesting really because uh, if you actually look at uh, where we were in the 90s um uh, we were th talking about, you know, steady and, you know, steady, it might go on forever, reducing uh, carbon emissions, just as this stuff was coming onto the agenda. Um, and then uh, a serious target was set by the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution in, in the year uh, 2000. Uh, and they said, OK, well, we need a 60% reduction by, by 2050. And a lot of us Greenies thought, wow, that's pretty radical. The government will never listen to that. But they did. And it was there in the, in, in the Climate Change Act shortly afterwards so that became the government target and then that has been revised in the last couple of years as i'm sure you're all aware down to an 80 percent reduction by 2050. this is this is a rapid change i mean over over you know a few years this the the changing of targets and of course the lib dems uh copied our our, our title and they've got a, a zero carbon uh, by 2050 report okay now of course they're in the government <laughs> so uh it's, there's a rapid change uh, in that sense. Uh, so you could say, well, okay, well, what's our response to this? Our response is that these are all very good, you know, these are, these are fine targets. What really counts actually is the area under the curve. How much gets emitted? Because it's accumulative, this stuff. So now our approach is much more nuanced than this. 
There it is. Can you see? That's our trajectory. We don't just sort of say, oh, right, low-hanging fruit, we've got to start right away, because you're going to need quite a lot of investment. You're going to need the new infrastructure. And that is actually going to increase your carbon emissions for a short while with the purpose of reducing it later. You've just got to do that if you are going to take it seriously. So the shape is going to be something like that. And then note, uh, eventually it goes down to zero and then below zero. That's a very important part of, uh, of, of the strategy, which, which has not been in a lot of, um, a, a lot, a lot of other similar plans. So what, some of the features, uh, there's going to be an effectively high price of carbon. That's, we can't really imagine it working without that. If there's a world agreement, it doesn't matter how this high carbon price is achieved, but there, if in effect there will be a very high carbon price. But at the moment it's less than £20 a tonne. So this is, a, this is a really serious change. But then this makes it into a serious driver. It's not economically crippling. It's the kind of level uh, of, like, we pay tax on, on motor fuel. Uh, if you compare that with the United States, it's, it's this kind of level. You know, we're all, we're all, we, we already do these kind of things. It doesn't actually kill the economy off, but, but it, it, it's quite a strong economic signal. Now, we're assuming that's there, and we're assuming that uh, if you have that kind of incentivization, then the world can be turned upside down. In other words, lots of things today that people say, it's completely uneconomic. In that world, it will be supremely economic, and lots of things which presently look slightly mad will be the obvious thing to do, and things today which seem all right and sensible and economic will be prohibitively expensive. So um, we have to assume that something like that is, is, is going to happen. Uh, we've got a, a, a combination of powering down, that is to say reducing uh, demand for uh, carbon intensive activities, and then uh, the demands are met by low carbon uh, supplies, and then we've got these crucial net negative processes going on in order to uh, mop up the remaining carbon emissions and bring it all down to zero. Uh, in ours, we haven't got any nuclear power, we haven't got any co carbon capture and storage uh, in the system. You could have that. It would make the sums easier, but we've managed to make it all add up without them. Uh, we've left them out for various reasons which I won't go into now, but uh, we, we, we've done it without those things. Okay, so the logical structure is this. <coughs> here's, here's the demand. We're reducing the demand for Mostly we're talking about energy, but all sorts of uh, carbon-intensive uh, processes. Uh, we will rationalise it so that we're actually supplying what everybody needs with a much lower primary supply. And then we are ramping up the, uh, the supply system, low and zero supply systems. Now you can see the two curves cross. Uh, we're aiming to get to a point where we've actually got stuff to sell. This is supposed to be an economic pro proposition. We end up with a surplus of what we what we are producing uh, relative to our uh, carbon emissions, uh, but there still are mopped up. Uh, there are some uh, remaining emissions, and we mop them up. We're having net negative processes. These are these are processes that actually absorb CO two in various ways and store it. Um, so we we actually when you add them all up, you get you get that curve. Mathematically, it makes complete sense, and I can't see why anybody else anyone doesn't agree that this is obvious way it's got to go. There isn't really much alternative. Uh, so now in terms of powering down, just to give some examples, uh, within the built environment, um, obviously we'd have lots of, uh, lots of R&D. You'd need to do that in order to work out how to do zero carbon buildings. Uh, we'd need to uh, look at 20 million buildings across the country and, and refurb them. Um, you'd have to have a lot of different planning, and that's been referred to earlier. Earlier, It makes a lot of difference, the actual physical geography of uh, where people live and where they work. Uh, the new buildings would obviously have rigorous standards. We're supposed to be having uh, zero carbon by 2016. This is already uh, a British government policy. Um, and they would have to be, in order to deliver that, we would have to train people. The building industry just isn't ready for that. Uh, so there's got to be a lot of retraining, and there's got to be a lot of inspection. So we really need to know what's happening. We can't just sort of say, oh, well, you get on, do the best you can, and we'll hope for the best. Stuff has got to be uh, monitored all the time. And then we propose a new role for buildings as carbon sinks. We are growing a lot of biomass, uh, and we're actually sticking it into buildings. So there could be uh, interesting implications for building design here. You're trying to make, make a building with as much material in it as possible rather than as little material in it as possible. That's, that's a bit queer. You know. 